It's a great tragedy, ladies and gentlemen. Millions of Americans suffering from a disease that was uh, discovered by, uh, I believe, is a German and Austrian named Lois Alzheimer's. It's called Alzheimer's. And uh, as far as we know, there's no cure. But many of these people with this thing are taking FDA-approved medication to treat the disease. But a new study shows that certain drugs are not helping the problem. As a matter of fact, they may be making it much worse. That's the discovery from best-selling author David Perlmutter, one of America's leading authorities on the brain. Five years ago, neurologist Dr. David Perlmutter launched a global phenomenon with the release of his best-selling book, Grain Brain. Since then, he's helped millions improve their health and fight against dementia and neurological diseases like Alzheimer's, all without drugs. Dr. Perlmutter says it's time to take control of your health. With his fully revised version of Grain Brain, he offers the latest nutritional and neurological updates so we can have a healthy, disease-free brain for life. Well, please welcome back to the 700 Club, Dr. David per Perlmutter. David, good to see you it's again. It's great to see you again. Hey, this revised book is just fascinating. You've got some updates, but it's a tremendous book. It's so what, well over a million copies worldwide. It's been a... 34 languages. 34 languages. Yes, sir. Well, uh, tell me the, the, the heart of this thing. What is the main problem we're talking about, you know, about people and their brains? Well, what are they doing to themselves? Well, I think that uh, you, you talked about it in the setup very well, yeah. that we sort of live in a world that wants us to live our lives come what may and hope that we're going to have some magic pill to take care of our ills. And the yeah. reality is, as it relates to this situation, Alzheimer's is affecting 5.4 million Americans. Mm -hmm. We don't have a, a medication. We don't have anything close. And now what the study that you talked about uh, indicates is that the very drugs that doctors are prescribing are actually associated with worsening cognitive function. It's well, like a blood pressure pill that raises your blood pressure. You talk about the fact that... Uh what uh, Alzheimer's is is considered late stage diabetes. Is that is that one of the well? You know, it really does have to do with how the brain uses uh, glucose yeah. as an energy source. But the really empowering part of the story is, and we've known this even five years ago when I first wrote the book, that it is by and large a preventable disease based upon what you choose to do today. What? <laughs> Exercise. Cut your sugar. Uh, make sure that your sleep is restorative. These are those three things alone are huge in terms of empowering your brain to be healthy. Well, all that business about amyloid plaque and that kind of stuff, I mean, is, is that, uh, is, that is preventable? Well, it turns out that the amyloid plaque, which was really the focus of a lot of the pharmaceutical research, according to researchers like Dr. Rudolf Tanzi at Harvard, really, that's not the cause of the problem. It is what you mentioned earlier. Uh, it's an energetic issue related to using uh, glucose as a fuel. Mm -hmm. That actually begins to deteriorate about 30 years before people begin to have issues with their memory. So the message is we've got to implement a prevention strategy early on in life. Sure. Hey, by the way, there's something you point out in here that I, I am just death on those statins, but the Lipitor has at least is a billion dollar drug or a ten billion dollar. It's been enormously successful. But what is it about this whole business of taking cholesterol out of people's brains? This is the third time we've had this discussion yeah, tonight. Uh, let me just uh, say that uh, the statin drugs themselves, how they relate to our discussion right now. Yeah. A study appearing in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Uh, eight years ago, looked at 150,000 women taking statin drug and found that these women had a 71% increased risk for developing diabetes if they were taking statin medications. That's very important. Why? Because becoming a diabetic quadruples your risk for Alzheimer's disease. That's the connection that I'm concerned about between statin drugs and Alzheimer's disease. And you know, that's the American Medical Association. We've got to get that message out to people. Well, what is this obsession about cholesterol? Actually, you point out that your brain needs cholesterol to, to function. I don't mean to sound too cynical, but I think <laughs> the battle on cholesterol was similar to the battle uh, of, of fat. Yeah. There was a time when we were told low fat, no fat is the way to go. 
Cholesterol is a brain antioxidant. Uh, cholesterol is the chemical from which your body makes testosterone, cortisol, and even vitamin D. It's a vital chemical in the body. So the war on cholesterol, I think, is by and large unfounded. And I think the reason it became so popular is because there was the development of these drugs that could lower cholesterol. It's far more important, I believe, to lower blood sugar, and that is done by changing your diet. Who knew? Well, the drug companies, I mean, you know, I trust my heart to Lipitor. You've seen those ads. It's done, it makes you sick. It's just You're trusting your heart to the manufacturer of a drug. You're trusting your heart to somebody who wants to manipulate your buying habits. Unbelievable. I'll tell you something really interesting that I just wrote a, a piece about, and that is a study came out several months ago in the journal Neuropharmacology, uh, Neuropsychopharmacology, mm -hmm. that demonstrated that children taking ADHD medications yeah. have, when they become adults, a nine-fold increased risk for developing Parkinson's disease. That's really important information. Well, they, they give that Ritalin and stuff like that to these kids. I mean, like candy. It's unbelievable. And, they do. And that would cause uh, uh, Parkinson's in these kids? Ninefold increased risk for Nine Parkinson's fold? disease. It was in the journal Neuropsychopharmacology. Well, the parents know that? I mean, these, these uh, they're uh, automatically, they, they said they got AHD, you know, uh, attention deficit disorder and all that stuff. I mean, the, the nurses in the schools are telling them to take Ritalin and these other drugs. Pat, parents don't know that, and that's why you and I do what we do, to give out this information, to empower people to be a little bit more proactive and make the right choices. It's very important for parents to recognize that this is a developing brain that's being exposed to amphetamines. That's what Ritalin is. Yeah. And now we see a potential very serious downside in the long run. We want to practice under the notion of above all, do no harm. Yeah. Well, what, what makes kids hyperactive? I mean, you talk, is it the diet thing that's doing? I think it's mostly diet. And I think the, uh, we know that hyperactivity is becoming much more prevalent. I think part of that is because doctors tend to be uh, diagnosing it more and more and paving the way for using medication. Uh, one of the governing bodies of, in pediatrics here in America has lowered the age at which that can be diagnosed to four years of age, meaning that we can, not me, uh, doctors uh, who do this type of work can prescribe uh, these medications to kids as young as four years. Well, the parents don't give it, though. I mean, a judge could say, well, we're going to take your kids away because this is child abuse. I mean, it's, it makes you sick. It's your stomach to think about it. I prefer not to be sick. I, pre <laughs> I prefer to be encouraged to right. do what we do and okay. get, uh, you know, look at the candle and not curse the darkness. And that is get out the information. Knowledge is very, very empowering. All right, let's talk about uh, the, um, what is it in the bread that is causing this problem? You know, they, they, they talk about bread being gluten-free. What, what is gluten? Why do they put it in bread? Well, it's not a, an issue that they put it in, in bread. Gluten is important because it's glue. That's where the word comes from. And it allows when bread is, uh, is, is fermenting, basically, uh, for the gases to be trapped in these compartments, which allows the bread to rise. So that's the beauty of gluten, and we, we love that chewy texture. But it turns out that gluten contains one of its proteins called gliadin that is very threatening to the gut. And you and I have talked about the importance of the gut bacteria. Right. There was a piece in the New York Times two days ago that said there's a relationship between the gut bacteria and the brain. Uh, that's something you and I talked about four Big years time. ago. Big time. Oh, my goodness. We've, but, we've had a whole book on it. And... That's right. Uh, but it turns out that, you know, we've seen so much gluten enter the human diet, and it turns out it increases inflammation. Why that's important is because this mechanism, inflammation, is the cornerstone of not just the brain situations like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, but really all chronic degenerative conditions as well that the World Health Organization tells us are the most common cause of death on planet Earth. Uh, here you've got in this very interesting book, uh, talk about some of these other things. I mean, uh, what is it about wheat, for example? Uh, we're seeing now ads about a, a 
people who have been exposed to the uh, uh, in, in, well, the, the, the plant killers that they spray on on uh, This the is a very big point. Well, what, what is glyophosphate? Is that what it's called? Yes, and this really gets to the, uh, the notion of why we have these genetically modified foods, which is, I, I've always thought is kind of a scary thought to begin with. Uh, the reason, by and large, that we have GMO food, and wheat isn't one of them, oddly enough, mm -hmm. though it is sprayed with glyphosate and herbicide, is that it allows farmers to plant seeds and have crops upon which they can spray this weed killer called glyphosate. Research by Dr. Stephanie Seneff at MIT has shown that this weed killer, which then becomes part of the foods we eat, threatens our gut bacteria leading to inflammation. And I mentioned to you a moment ago why that is so pivotal in terms of what's happening globally in terms of health. You know, Pat, this is the second year in a row that life expectancy in Americans for both men and women has declined. That's a very, very scary proposition. Mm -hmm. It means we're doing something wrong. Our mission is to identify what that might be and then make it right. Well, the trade name is Roundup, and they're suing people on Roundup. And one guy died of this stuff, and and it's a huge settlement. And they're they're having ads on the, on the television about people who who sued on account of Roundup. That's true. And the World Health Organization, again, has indicated that glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup, yeah. is a probable, not possible, a probable human carcinogen. And it's being sprayed by, you know, metric tons around the world on the food that we eat. Now, something's very wrong with that connection. Well, it, almost, it gets into the wheat? I mean, it, it... Well, it is sprayed on wheat, even though wheat is not genetically modified. It's sprayed on wheat as what we call a desiccating agent. It dries it out and allows farmers to get their wheat to market more quickly. So it has very much involved itself in, in the food resources that we consume. What about, the, the, again, the, 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 the uh, well, the, the, the material that is fed to our animals that make them fat, uh, is that going to affect us? I mean, the meat that we eat is... is... Yes, in fact, uh, you know, the, the food that animals eat, there's no alchemy. It doesn't magically turn into something wonderful. And I talk about that a lot in the new yeah. revised edition, that when we treat animals with, when we feed them glyphosate-laced grains yeah. and treat them with hormones and antibiotics, it does have an effect on the quality of that meat and makes it a, a less salubrious or less healthful choice for us. So I do believe that a diet that is mostly plant-based is appropriate. If you choose to eat meat, uh, fish for example, it should be wild, not farm-raised. Mm -hmm. Meat should be grass-fed. Chicken should be free-range chicken, for example. There's a place for that. Uh, but you know we've got to reconnect to the notion that the quality of our food matters a whole heck of a lot in terms of our health destiny. Well, we have, of course, the thing about this gut bacteria, we made a big deal about the gut bacteria, but apparently uh, uh, the, these uh, uh, materials that are put into this beet uh, will kill the gut bacteria, and that, that will destroy the beneficial effect of the gut biome. It's true, and what we depend on mostly from our gut bacteria, in a word, mm -hmm. is diversity. Yeah. The more diverse species we have in our gut, uh, the better for us. It gives us resiliency to deal with the onslaughts of the viruses to which we are exposed, uh, the toxins in our modern world to mm -hmm. which we are exposed. Our gut bacteria are even, in some ways, controlling our mood, how we see the world around us. So there's, in a very real sense, they help to make us happy and appreciative for all that we have. But the antibiotics can, can kill the gut bacteria. The antibiotics, even a single course of antibiotics, which can be life-sustaining, yeah. life-saving, as we all know. But we have to be super judicious because even a single course will change the gut bacteria to some degree on a permanent basis. All right, well, what should people be eating? Again, I think the diet should be mostly plant-based. I will eat wild fish and uh, some free-range chicken, grass-fed beef on occasion. But the thing to look for in your food, as uh, again, is diversity. 
having a lot of different color on your plate. And I think one of the biggest issues that really isn't talked about in our modern world is the critical importance of two things, yeah. fiber and fat. Okay. Eat more good fat, olive oil, for example, a wonderful fat. Olive oil is. Olive oil is the best. Well, what about some of these others that are out there? I mean, like margarine, is that that's bad or good? Uh, I wouldn't go near it. You wouldn't? Uh, okay. I wouldn't go near it. You know, um, there are a lot of oils that are on the grocery store shelf, a lot of vegetable oils that have been so highly processed. Those, what do they do? They increase inflammation. And our mission is to decrease that process, decrease inflammation again, the cornerstone for just about every disease that, that you don't want to get. Yeah. Well, you got the omega-3s and the omega-6s and so forth. We'll, we'll talk about those. So by and large, we figure, uh, we, we understand that the omega-3s help reduce inflammation, whereas those omega-6s, the safflower oil, the corn oil, the sunflower oil, these tend to increase uh, inflammation. And interestingly, new science shows that how this happens in the body is through a system called the endocannabinoid system, mm -hmm. which was only recently discovered. And that sort of plays into this whole notion of, of medical marijuana that has become <laughs> uh, so, uh, so well thought of or, or popular these days, people are looking at it. But the point is that this endocannabinoid system is something that exists within all of us. And it is there that whether we choose to eat more omega-3s versus more of the pro-inflammatory omega-6s is really leveraged in terms of how it treats our body and, in my world, how it treats the brain. The brain is very sensitive to inflammation. Well, where do we get the threes? Well, what are the sources of them? So omega-3s come from uh, things like fish oil. There are various plant-based uh, oils that are good. Flaxseed oil helps, uh, helps our bodies make omega-3s. But I would say that fish oil, cod liver oil, uh, krill oil, if you choose to be vegetarian, there are omega-3s that are vegetarian derived that provide DHA that are made from algae. Uh, this is something that's critically important, not just for the brain and cognition and even getting back to uh, helping children who have been diagnosed with ADHD, but even as it relates to controlling blood sugar and even heart disease as well. well now the average person is going to sit down to breakfast. What should he be eating or he or she be eating for breakfast? A more protein at breakfast, more fiber, and more fat. And let me push it a little bit further. All right. Uh, I believe there's a lot of validity to making your first meal of the day maybe at noon or maybe even 2 o'clock in the afternoon to extend the time that you actually haven't eaten uh, from your evening meal the night before. We're now recognizing that the time that you don't eat, the fasting period, yeah. is actually uh, really quite important for you in terms of activating parts of your DNA that tend to reduce inflammation, that may code for longevity. So that first meal, which is by definition your break fast, might well be later in the day than you might have been told well, by. The, the average meal is a big dinner at night with uh, steak and french fries and potatoes and all that stuff. It Great. sounds delicious as you describe it <laughs> because I haven't had my breakfast yet. Uh, but really I think we should push to have that bigger meal uh, earlier in the day, uh, around five o'clock, and then begin that fast. Mm. There's such power for your health and your immunity uh, for f by fasting, and even specifically as it relates to your, your brain and your ability to focus. You know, we take a great lesson from the notion that Jesus fasted for 40 days prior to his public ministry. That's right allowing uh, the ability to get to that really intense part of, of your brain and spirituality to deliver the message that we all uh, want to deliver as well. What, what grains are uh, healthy? Uh, you talk about fiber. Which are the good ones? Are they? I'm loving that question <laughs> because Dr. Perlmutter has always been described as the anti-grain. I wrote a book, Grain Brain, for That's crying right. out loud. And uh, the reality is it's not the grains themselves that are the issue. It is the fact that by and large grain based foods are a powerful source of carbohydrate and simple sugars, mm -hmm. the way we receive them today. Yeah. So to have some uh, whole grain corn or rice, for example, that hasn't been sprayed with glyphosate uh, is not a bad idea in moderation if you're counting your carbohydrate calories. 
Uh, it's the notion that 40% of foods in America are derived from wheat that becomes threatening really from the notion of the fact that they're, they're so modified as to prevent us from getting good fiber and powerful concentrated sources of simple carbohydrate that is directly threatening to brain health. Well, you, you, you'd think that the leafy vegetables, spinach and kale and that kind of thing is better? I am so dialed in on that. And yeah. uh, yes, sir, that's the answer. The, the thing to look for on your plate is color, diversity of color. And that's an indication that you're getting a diversity in nutrients and you're going to be getting a lot of fiber. Why do you want the fiber? You want to nurture that 100 trillion bacteria that live within you because they want you to be healthy. They're making B vitamins. They're controlling your mood. They're directing sort of the type of food that you, you go to. And uh, how incredible it is that as we reduce inflammation, mm -hmm. what our next book is going to talk about called Brainwash is that reducing inflammation helps us connect to the actual anatomy of the brain that allows us to be more empathetic and compassionate mm -hmm. and plan for the future. That the structural wiring of the brain is influenced by two things. The foods that we eat and the actions in which we participate. By acting empathetic and compassionate towards others, you actually rewire your brain that's so that you can do more of that. that. That's coming in January of 2020. Wonderful. Well, the, the other thing I want to ask you about, uh, uh, berries are good for you, uh, nuts and berries. Uh, have... Nuts and berries. Uh, I'm on the road right now traveling. That's what's in my suitcase. Uh, but, but berries are really a rich source of antioxidants. We mm -hmm. know that. Uh, we've got to be careful, though, not eating too much. Though it's fruit, it could be organic. That's wonderful. You still got to watch the sugar content mm -hmm. because that sugar is will raise blood sugar, will have an effect on insulin, and we want to be very careful with how we control our insulin levels because the brain really depends upon insulin uh, to be fully functional. Well, are, are American people killing themselves? Why, why are we so fat now? This is tremendous. You know, it's it's uh, it's a very good question because it's happening in ways that we cannot imagine. Mm -hmm. And to be clear, there's a very powerful relationship between the size of your belly <clears throat> and your risk for brain degeneration 30 years later. It was published in the journal Neurology. The, the biggest issue with respect to why we are gaining weight is the shift of, uh, in the diet away from fat to a diet that's richer in carbohydrates, as well as the shift that's happened in our microbiome. One of the biggest players in terms of obesity in America is, believe it or not, our consumption of artificial sweeteners. These mm -hmm. diet drinks that contain zero sugar, yeah. zero carbohydrate, are associated with changes to the gut bacteria that signals to the body that calories are scarce. So the body holds on and makes fat. So mm -hmm. what an irony that artificially sweetened beverages are associated with a dramatic increased risk for weight gain. So people who are eating or drinking Diet Cokes, and Diet Pepsi, and that kind of stuff are actually getting fatter, thinking they're going and thin. And increasing their risk for type 2 diabetes, which, as I mentioned earlier, is associated with as much as quadrupling your risk for Alzheimer's, where we started this segment talking yeah. about the drugs. Yeah. The drugs that are given to, to Alzheimer's patients uh, and their families think that this is the best we can do, mm -hmm. how heart-wrenching it is to recognize that these drugs are making mom or dad or husband or wife actually decline cognitively more quickly. Unbelievable. Doctor, this book is so interesting. Ladies and gentlemen, it's fascinating. If, you, if you're like me, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of into this stuff, as I'm sure you know. But uh, Dr. Pearl Motors has updated the green brain, and he's got another book coming out shortly about... Uh, but these things will change your life. And we are strong on having a healthy gut, the biome being proper, and that second brain filled with hundreds of millions or trillions of little, uh, uh, well, whatever they are, bacteria or something, that they can make you uh, healthy and happy and you can live a long life like, like I have. So, doctor, thank you so much. That, your book is available everywhere, right? Yes, sir, it is. And thank you again for having me. Well, it's a pleasure. You're always fun to have with us.
Grain Brain is called. This is the new book, Dr. David Perlmutter, MD. You can get it where books are sold. You'll find it fascinating. God bless you. Thanks so much for being with us. Good to see you.